The subject at hand is one of religion. We've discussed for some time now the old sin nature. Why? It's because the old sin nature is an enemy within. It is perhaps the greatest enemy that we have. But there are two other enemies, the world and the devil. And two things about them that we need to understand. They have a strategy. They have a scheme of things to confuse, to deceive, and to get people off track with God. Now, of course, one of those ways, as, um, as we had testified, is uh, uh, the, the nightlife uh, uh, route. Sometimes uh, people can go that and get their eyes off the Lord. But especially the religious aspect of it. And that's what we're going to talk about, religion. We're going to see that it has an, a definition and just how detrimental is it to us. In fact, most people have religions whether they uh, accept it or not. For example, an atheist has a religion. He believes that he is God and uh, that he controls his fate and so forth. This is where you get the aspect of, of positive thinking and the like. But positive thinking has also spilled over into the church. Uh, Methodism's own Norman Vincent Peale with his pow uh, power of positive thinking uh, has, has brought tried to bring atheistic man over into uh, uh, the religious aspect of it and uh, six of one half dozen of another. Uh, what does it matter if you're an atheist or you believe in positive thinking? Really, it doesn't. Both are going to hell and will burn there. Only those who reject religion in favor of a relationship are going to go to heaven. Now, technically, uh, a religion can mean any system of belief. So what we're doing here actually is practicing, and I just despise that word practice, but is practicing a religion. In that sense, we are religious. But might I say, only in that sense. Religion is our enemy. And so, therefore, we do not say we have a religion, though technically uh, the, the first definition of the word is any, any scheme of beliefs, any type of belief. But we're going to see that actually the Bible gives us two definitions of religion. They're quite lengthy here, uh, and uh, I, have, I have brought together in these two definitions what the Bible says with regard to a religion. Now, what you're looking at is something that is, is your enemy. You work with people who are, and I quote, very religious. I hear this constantly. Well, they're good people. They're very religious. They go to church every Sunday. Or uh, my neighbors are Seventh-day Adventists, and they're very religious. They never miss their Sabbath day. And uh, I was reminded of that driving to the office uh, yesterday as I took the, the back route there to go down 41. I saw the first Seventh-day Adventist church and all the cars there. Uh, there weren't that many, actually, but uh, they were having a church service on the Sabbath day. Well, they're very religious. The Jehovah's Witnesses are very religious. I saw uh, one of the Moonies in the grocery store. He uh, was uh, uh, quite an attractive fellow, and uh, he had uh, sort of cornered uh, quite an attractive young lady. And he was saying, uh, will, will you not buy one of these pictures? Now, I knew that he was a Mooney simply because I had had his sister in the faith come to my office just the week before trying to sell these same pictures for students in Russia. We're putting them through college, so won't don't you give? Finally, she said, look, I don't want the pictures. And he said right there in the store, well, won't you just give a dollar toward this project? And she said to get him off her back. Yes. So uh, people are very religious. What is a religion? It is any 
humanly devised scheme. Now you'll note the operative word there. It's something that man has come up with. It's something that man has thought about and man has put together as a means of a relationship with God. So it's any system of belief or practice that is uh, specifically designed for something. It, there is a prescription involved here. You must follow this to make yourself something. Now, what was the first thing that the serpent wanted man to do in the garden? Make himself equal with God. Is that not true? He didn't ask man to, to commit an immoral sin, but a moral one, actually. Uh, a religious sin. You don't need to follow the prescription that God has given you to have a relationship with him. You can make up your own. So anytime as I drive around the, uh, the uh, town and I see all of these churches with all of these people, I simply say, they're very religious. Oh, they've got a big crowd going there. That's a religious crowd. Because that's all it is. It's something that somebody with a suave personality and human genius has concocted in order to attract people to make them feel good in the flesh with regard to their relationship with God. So anything that tries to make one one with God or equal with God or personally deserving of his acceptance. Why do the people go to church? Because they think that their good works are somehow going to outweigh their bad works if they simply go to church. And in eternity, God's going to say, oh, looky here, you logged more time in church than you did uh, in, the, in the tavern. And so that's, that's, going to, that's going to be okay. You logged more time in, in a religious thing than you did here. So that's going to, that's going to make it okay. Well, it, it's, it's not going to make it okay. Your good works do not outweigh your bad works. Why? Because if they're humanly concocted, if they're humanly produced, God rejects the works of the flesh. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. And religion is a work of the flesh. It's something that the flesh has, has um, conceived in order to make man feel good about himself in earning a relationship with God. Now, it can be two things. Means and efforts concocted independently of God's system. That is, somebody uh, sat down like Buddha or Confucius and has, has said, uh, we're going to have this way, and that of course is what uh, the Buddhists call it, the way of enlightenment. Uh, totally apart from the Bible, some man sat down named Buddha and said, this is the way we're going to go. But then there are others, starting with, with Roman Catholicism, uh, Episcopalianism, on down with all of the denominations we could go. They combine with God's system. Uh, the Catholics, for example, they, they use Old Testament Judaism, New Testament Christianity. Uh, they use mythology and on and on we go. The traditions of men, the Apocrypha, as a, as a co combination of things. Well, what do they have? A true relationship with God? No. What they have is a corrupted combination of God's system and theirs. The minute you add something different to what God has pre prescribed, you have a religion. And religion is the enemy of man, though man has made it his good friend. Now, that's the first definition of religion. There's a second definition of religion. Any humanly developed strategy which advocates the transforming of one's character. Now, here is where morality comes in. Morality is important for any of the divine uh, establishments that God has made. But simply transforming one's character does not get you saved. 
And that's what people think of uh, with regard to, to people. They must be Christians. They're so good. That is not true. All they're doing is externally conforming themselves to a, a creed or a code. Now, please don't get me wrong. There is another group who says, well, we don't have a creed or a code. We're under grace. We're not under law. And so, therefore, there are no rules and regulations for believers. That is an extreme on the other side. That's not right. If you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to follow the Word. What is the Word? It's a, it's a code. It's a creed. It's something to be believed. It's something uh, to, to be performed by you. But yet, there are those, especially with uh, the religious aspect, who think that, well, if I can just um, conform myself to a certain creed, I'm going to be okay. That is absolutely not true. Or the performing of certain supposed good works or deeds. Now, what is, what is the thrust today? What is the push today? To have religions, number one, help in the cleanup of the environment. We see, and as I go past certain churches from time to time, their marquee will have recycling day. You know, once a month, it's recycling day, and everybody brings their bottles, their papers, and their cans. Now, it is not that we're not, we don't want to enjoy our environment protect it, respect it. It's God given. We derive our life from it. We want to live without the, uh, the poisons and the toxins and we want to protect our children. But the fact of the matter is the religions out there that I'm talking about that push the recycling don't believe that Moses wrote the book of Genesis and don't believe that the first five chapters are for real. These same churches that are interested in the environment, if they would only believe that God cursed the environment, that, that no matter what we do, it's going to get worse and worse, not better and better. Although man is going to clean it up, God is going to make it more difficult for man to live as man is religious. We're, we're entering into a religious age. And it's interesting that religion has taken up the task of cleaning up the world. If they were dispensationalists, they would know that the world is not going to get better and that to have this obsession of making the world better apart from God is nothing more than evil. Environmental, environmentalism apart from spirituality is evil. It's making your life better, your world better, your circumstances better by your own self-control and not relying upon God. Isn't that why God wrote, wrote Romans 8, 28? All things work together for good to them who what? Love God. Oh, if you're a religionist, you don't love God. But I go to church. I don't care. Loving God means accurately studying his word. Being approved of God means study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't believe in the first five chapters of the book of Genesis, are you rightly dividing the word? You're a heretic. You're an apostate. And those religions who do not believe in the fundamentals of the faith, inspiration of Scripture being one of them, are absolutely out of line. Now, they perform the good works. So what's the next thing? Well, what was the next thing once Adam and Eve got real religious? Eve fed Adam, feeding people. They sewed fig leaves together and clothed one another, clothing people. Because they think, then here's the liberal philosophy, they think that they are their brother's keeper. And that somehow, if they can just uh, uh, give a little bit to people who don't have, that is their good work since working their way to heaven. That's why they're so zealous about it. They do not realize that they have a covering and a clothing that is far better that they do not offer these people who are in rags. 
If these people who are in rags would turn to Christ, trust God to provide their needs, that they wouldn't necessarily live lives in rags, that God would promote them accordingly, that they're in their trouble because they're Christ rejectors and God haters. And so God simply says, okay, that's fine. Let me show you how tough it can be living life apart from me. So he makes them poor. But these other people have a little bit rich. And so they say a little bit of riches. Oh, well, we'll use these to buy our way into heaven. I'll buy this poor person some clothes. I'll buy them a can of beans. Do they not read the same Bible that we read? We're not redeemed with corruptible things such as what? silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Their works are dead works. They're no good. They're not outweighing anything. And so therefore, their good deeds are nothing. Again, it's, it's simply a way of trying to better one's world without the gospel message. Now, a couple things about this in our definition. Man assumes and presumes to earn the approval of God by his human merit, whether for salvation or spirituality. The minute you start doing that is the minute you become religious. And the minute you reject the filling of the Holy Spirit in favor of, I'm a good person, I'll put on the false face. No, no one will ever know, but down deep on the inside, I am out of fellowship, but uh, um, on the outside, I'll just pretend. You see, that's what religion does. Religion favors an external appearance while rejecting in the internal reality. And so therefore, we reject any type of religious activity. We are not religionists here. All right. Note, in keeping with our uh, study, religious Genesis chapter three. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, you'll not eat of the trees of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. I want you to, to note something there. We've been here so many times before, but be interested here in a religious discussion. What do they say? Don't discuss politics or, or religion. That's nonsense. The first thing that the serpent did was, I'm interested in religion. Just how much do you know about your religion? Uh, can you say what you believe? If someone were to ask you, if you were put to the test, can you tell them what we believe here? Could you tell them why you don't go to uh, various things and have fellowship in various ways and, and the like? Could you tell them why we believe what we believe here? All right. What has God said? Now, note what she did, like most Good religionist. Last part of verse three, you don't eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, God never said that. What did she do? She combined her own thinking with that of God. She corrupted God's word by her own human conjectures. Well, God said, don't even touch it. He did not say that. He said, you're just simply not allowed to eat of it. You see, religious people add to the word of God and take from the word. In this religious discussion, Satan said, you're not going to die. Verse four, that's taking away from the word of God. So uh, any people who remove accurate theology and doctrine from the scripture or who remove chapters and verses from the Bible are those who are religionists. 
And, uh, and we need to know that because we're going to be discussing things coming up that have to do with why this, that, and the other. We do things here in a certain way. It's simply because we're not religionists. We're not going to be religionists. We're not ecumenical. And, uh, and God being my witness, I'll never be ecumenical. We will fellowship with those of like precious faith. For God does know the day you eat your of, you'll be as gods. There you go. You'll, there's the definition of religion. Anything in an attempt to make man one with God, equal with God, or have God accept them or approve of their lives apart from his system. What was God's system in the garden? Don't eat of the tree. That's all they had to do. All they had to do was obey God. All right. There's another picture of religion in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Verse 2. Last part of the verse. Abel, the second born son of Adam and Eve, was a keeper of the sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, here's the classic conflict between religionist people and relationship people. What type of a person are you? If you're a religionist, you're out of fellowship. If you're a religious, you're out of sync. If you're a religionist, you're wrong. If you're somehow thinking that your human works can add anything to the, to the blessing of the cross work of Christ, you're a religionist and God rejects you. How do I know? He rejected this religionist. Now, the person who was a relationship person was Cain. In the process of time, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. Now, did Cain go to church? Answer, yes, he did. <laughs> Here I come, Lord. Uh, this is Cain, it's me. Uh, God, God and me, we're one, you see. He walks through the door. What, what a blessing I am to the people of this church. I'm so, I've got all of these good works that I have done. And he places them right on the altar. Uh, if there were trumpet players at that time, they would have played the trumpets and, and, and sounded the alarm. Here is Cain. He is such a good religious person. Abel brought the first things of the flock. But the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And it made Cain mad and his countenance fell. Now, let me just ask you the question. As we bring this into today's society, in keeping with our definitions of religion, Abel was a relationship person. Cain was a religion person. Now, as people go to church today, what do they do? They bring their human good works with them into the service and say, God, see how good I am. Or God, by being here, I'm showing you how good I am. It's an offering of my hands to you. Now, they should have learned, at least Cain should have, that fig leaves... The sap of trees was different from the blood coursing through the veins of an animal. And that God rejects the sap of trees in favor of the blood. And that there never has been a time where man has redeem been redeemed with anything apart from the blood. You've got to have the blood. Now, the blood of bulls and goats, I realized, was just a temporary thing. But it was in favor of the more permanent redemptive factor, the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, Cain was a religionist. He, again, distorted the word of God. He changed the word of God. He acted differently than, than the standard of the word of God. And he got mad. That's why he ended up killing Abel. But uh, the fact of the matter was that he was a religionist. Now, from what do we get this concept of religion? Comes from several different words in the Latin. First of all, from the word religio, which means to give reverence to God or the gods. 
But the problem with that is that actually that doesn't convey the true concept. You've got to take the word apart to do that. Re, the first part of the word, means back or back again. Ligare means to bind or to tie back. And so therefore the meaning is this. To bring back together again, to bind or to tie together. So, um, a person says, well, all of us have the spark of God in us. We're just ignorant of that and we need some encouragement and inspiration to fan the flame of the spark of deity within us. And once we know how to do that, we'll be brought back into a relationship with God. Or even the Catholics will say, there is an original sin. But you have to go through this process, this, uh, this program of constantly working your way to where you get your forgiveness of sins. That is what they call reconciliation or redemption of tying man back to God and bringing them together and making them one. So that's what a religion is. Any plan, process, program, practice, or procedure where man either harms himself or tries to improve himself apart from God's system is a religion. And therefore should be rejected. All religion has been rejected by God himself. Okay? Therefore we need to see that the Apostle Paul gives us, and this is just a brief study of the doctrine of religion, but Paul gives us why we are not religionists here. There are several Pauline descriptions of religion. All right? In chapter 25 of Romans chapter 1, Paul describes religion as a lie. It is so hard to conceive of, of people going to church all the time lying about it. <laughs> it is hard to conceive that there are ministers behind the so-called sacred desk who are doing nothing but being there to promote and prosper by lying. Verse 25, whenever you change the truth of God, you automatically make it a lie. Every religion is a lie. Every pastor who teaches religiously is a liar, full-fledged. He's leading people down the primrose path to hell. And that's exactly what's going on here. They worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Can you imagine? Whose words take precedence over God's words? This religion, uh, the founding father, uh, that pastor, uh, that group of people. Rather than following the truth, they change it. Exactly what Eve did. Exactly what Cain did. They were religious people, and religious people always want to change the Word of God. And uh, you, you've got to be very, very uh, careful with regard to that, uh, and, and so forth, of changing the Word, of keeping it as it is in the original text, not making it... Uh, um, uh, not making it uh, different. I had a, I had a, a question uh, with regard to a paraphrase version just this past week, and uh, this this question said, well, now it says here in the book of Romans chapter fourteen, and it was talking about if a man feels that it is wrong, it is wrong. Now it, it was a paraphrase version. And, uh, and I turned to the King James and I said, okay, now look, what does the King James use? And it said, faith. Now, faith is the Greek word pistis. The interesting thing about the Greek word pistis is that it can never mean feeling, it has to mean faith. What did the paraphrase do? 
what many of the new translations do, change the truth of God into a lie. Many of them have used inferior manuscripts rather than the majority text, the textus receptus with, with regard to translation. And you've got to be very careful with regard to that because sure, sure as uh, shooting, you will read it and, and, be, and be believing something that was not truly represented in the text. Okay, now the second thing with regard to religions. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That is the second description that Paul gives of a religion. First of all, he says that it is a lie simply because it is based upon changing the truth of God's word. Every religion is, is based on a lie, has to be, or a combination of a lie and truth. The things of the flesh, well, you say, Pastor, this is talking about the old sin nature. That's true. Who do you suppose developed religions? Man. Well, if man was filled with the spirit, would he have to go apart from the word? in order to have his, his so-called religion? No, it is something that he developed himself. Well, if he developed it himself, he's going contrary to the word. Therefore, what nature is he under in order to develop his religion? It is the old sin nature. Verse five, therefore says, those that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Again, I repeat to you, the standard comment when somebody has been in an inspirational service, it was good to have been. I felt really good to have been there. Uh, most of these churches where they're trying to make people feel good do never speak on sin. And so therefore, they always go out of church feeling pretty good. Uh, give a little pat on the back, uh, recharge your batteries, do better now. Uh, you're a good person, be kind to your neighbor. It's going to see you through. Those are the things of the flesh. That's a religion. Now, it's not wrong, as I have said many times, to give a legitimate compliment, to try to make somebody feel good because they've done a good job. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, people going to a, a church service and they have seen the statue cry. And oh, they just cry and they're just so emotional. Or going to Benny Hinn's service and, and, and lifting your hands and being filled with the Spirit and oh, how good it feels. And we've discussed what that is. It's the things of the flesh, pure and simple. He calls it also the carnal mind in verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. If they were spirit-filled people, they would want to obey the word of God. But because they have deviated in heresy and apostasy, obviously their mind is carnal. Well, this is not taught in the scripture. I, I, I say again, there is a, a, a big church here that uh, is following the quote Willow Creek experience with drama and the fine arts and all the big massive programs they have. But you ask them what they believe about the Trinity. Oh, we believe that those are just three titles of the same person, not three distinct people. What is that? That's a carnal mind. Who told them they could believe that way? The Bible? No. Are they filled with the Spirit? No. Are they attracting people through the filling of the Spirit? No. They have apostatized from the faith. They're carnal. Now, Romans chapter 9, verse number 32. We've just got a minute here. Paul calls religions stumbling stones. Paul calls religions, actually the word, uh, yeah, the word here is a stumbling stone. We're going to see that it's called a stumbling block. Verse 32, 
Why didn't Israel attain to the law of righteousness? Verse 32, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were the works of the law. They had a religion. Now, if they had truly followed what Moses wrote, it had been one thing. But they were continually adding the traditions of the fathers and other things to the pure faith Moses wrote about. They just stuck to the scriptures that had been okay. But Jesus said, you've corrupted the commandments of God because you have inserted the traditions of men. And so therefore they tried to religiously, that was their problem. They didn't exercise faith. But did they go to church? Yes. Did they have a religion? Yes. Did they try to better themselves morally? Absolutely. But the apostle Paul says he calls that a stumbling stone. Now, let's go to chapter 14 and verse 13. This will be our last verse, and we'll stop here. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. See, Pastor, judge not that you be not judged. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about in the matter of doubtful disputations, areas that could go one way or the other, and you have to understand principles to live by during these gray areas of life. But judge this rather. See, the Bible does say judge. Make a de competent decision. What? That no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. The minute you become religious, you are apt to make another fall. Are all of these churches right? Can't be. They provide stumbling stones or stumbling blocks to people in an attempt to make them acceptable to God and approved to God, all the while putting obstacles in their way over which they trip in their journey to God's type of righteousness. The Apostle Paul says you're not allowed to do it. This type of stumbling stone, as we uh, stop, has to do with... It's called the cornerstone. It, it just doesn't fit anywhere and, it, and it's in the way as you're building the building. It's the last stone to go in. Uh, actually, it's the first one that should be chosen, but it's the last stone to go in. So what do you do as you're building this building? You don't want to throw away the stone, but there it is. And you're constantly hitting your toe over it. This, this stumbling stone. And uh, that's what the Apostle Paul said. It's a, it's a stumbling block. It, uh, it's something that should be set aside for uh, its, its proper use. But instead, uh, the Apostle Paul says that people use this to make others trip. Oh, what, a, what an irresponsible action to say things and do things in a church service that causes others to uh, trip in their spiritual life.